I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It was a, uh, a wild start today. Uh, we're just sitting in here. We hear some kind of explosion. Next thing you know, we're back on the air playing in the same spot we left. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> so I want to thank all of our partners for praying for us because, you know, it was a very wild time. Maybe we can tell you about it sometime. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together today as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now today on this particular broadcast, I want to talk to you about three things. One is, the Lord began to talk to me about this before daylight. Uh, I was writing this in the dark said perfection, conviction, and correction. These three things, perfection, conviction, and correction. Perfection is what he has done. It's in that. Conviction is when you start moving away from perfection. And correction is his word given to you to get you back on the path. Now, I want you to listen to some of this perfect, uh, just some of the definitions of perfect. Perfect in quality, the state of being perfect, such as freedom uh, from faults or defects, a flawlessness, maturity, having no flaw or imperfection. Perfect being uh, entirely without fault or defect, uh, satisfying all requirements. Out of it comes the word accurate, free from error, especially as a result of care, confirming exactly to truth or to standards, able to give an accurate result, going, uh, going to, reaching, or hitting the intended mark, not missing the target, exact, to call for urgently and obtain from, uh, as this, uh, like they gave this example, Eisenhower made a statement one time, from, uh, from them has been exacted the ultimate sacrifice. Perfection is a big word. Adam uh, was created in it, but he could not hold on to it. Out of the word perfection comes words like flawlessness, maturity, perfect, accurate, exact, and more. Think of it. This is what Jesus was, perfect in every way. No guile found in his mouth. He was perfection in every way. Hallelujah. And, he, and, and listen to this. I want you to think about this. Perfection in every way. And he stood out in a fallen world. He was the last Adam. The first Adam before the fall would have stuck out too. But Jesus came, God in the flesh, not only brought the perfection of the first Adam, but also brought the power to redeem a perfect man that fell. I want everybody to hear that. Not only, see, Jesus is called the last Adam, but he not only came and brought, uh, was a perfect man again, but he's God in the flesh, so he brought the power to redeem a perfect man that had fallen. You know, that's pretty heavy if you ask me. I, I don't know. I mean, to me it is. Now watch this. Um, he, brought, he brought the power to redeem uh, the perfect man because he's God in the flesh. Now, the first Adam was earthy and could not redeem himself. But the last Adam was the Lord from heaven, not only perfect in the natural, but also the Lord from heaven, God in the flesh. The world had never seen a being. They had never seen such a being because he wasn't created. He was the creator himself. He, he really stood out. He was a light that shined in darkness. Darkness recognized him 
as its destruction come to destroy the power of the enemy. He was darkness' greatest, he was their, their greatest enemy ever. He wasn't just the angelic beings in Lot's day that rescued Lot. He was the power that threatened all darkness. Perfection walking in every way. Perfectly pleasing the Father. This means he never made a decision or chose a word that didn't come from his Father, that he didn't hear from his Father, that he didn't hear him say. He never did anything he didn't see his Father do. He operated strictly out of faith, moved with compassion or love himself. I would imagine that whenever demons, wherever they were the night of his birth, they screamed out. Why? Dreading the time they may have to meet him in the earth. Because when the angels broke through the night of his birth, I want you to think about this. There they are. They're in the stable. Why was Jesus born in a stable? Because all sacrifices were born in the stable. And it was there at that stable that they were, uh, they were raising the temple sacrifice animals. And so there in that stable is where he was born. And he was born on a stone slab, wallowed out for a manger. And he was laid there after he was born, I mean. And he was laid there in a cave on a slab. And there he was. And the angel said, and he was wrapped in grave clothes. His mother wrapped him in that linen cloth. And so the angels appeared to the shepherds and said, this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes or grave clothes lying in a manger. What is the sign? He will look, he will, he came into this earth looking like the way he will leave this earth. He'll be in the same kind of tomb wrapped in the same kind of cloth, in the same kind of cave wrapped in the same kind. He said, it'll be the same. And this is a sign. So his birth is prophetic. Everything is prophetic. But when the angels broke through, you couldn't you hear them suddenly when they smashed through the dimension of time when he was born? As soon as he came from that virgin's womb and his head came into this world, the angels just couldn't stand it. And they tore through the atmosphere and said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. They were saying he has been born. You'll see this is a sign. He's coming. He'll be born looking like he'll die. This is him. And go. And don't you know all over this planet, demons heard that rumble and that sound. And they shook and looked around and, and in fear and dread from that day. What if I run into him in the earth? What if I meet him in the earth? They did not know what to do. Because it wasn't just two angels that came to rescue Lot. There was a heavenly host shouting and screaming across the spirit world. And every demon heard it. All of hell shook. I imagine the beings chained in darkness slammed themselves against the wall thinking he was coming there. Because it's obvious they were all afraid of him, that he would come and torment them. And don't you know every demon of hell had to lead, uh, let up on what they were doing when they heard that sound. What if I meet him, they thought. What if I encounter him in the earth? I want you to look at Luke chapter 4. And I want us to look at something there. We're talking about perfection right now. He is the perfect He's always the perfect. But I want you to look at Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. Now watch this. It says, all right, verse 18, his first message, well, we'll back up to verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, we know these scriptures and we look at these scriptures. And I want you to notice something. His message 
stirred up such demonic activity in his presence that they would just scream out. But let me see if I can find something for you. I want you to see this. You know, I get to riding quick early in the morning, and I just ride and ride and ride and ride. I want you to, to see this first. It says, we'll go all the way back to verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Galilee. Galilee means, listen to this. One of the meanings would be the heathen circle. So Jesus comes to the heathen circle. He comes down off the mountains and he goes to the, to the heathen circle. And it said when he goes around the heathen circle, you know, Galilee, the whole circle. And one of the examples was heathen circle. There went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. So he goes in all the heathen circles and they just, he becomes famous because he comes down there preaching. He comes down there preaching freedom. He comes down there preaching deliverance. He comes down there preaching all these things. And all the heathens love him. They're just on board. My God, look at this guy. You know, I mean, <laughs> so then after that it says, he taught in their synagogues in verse 15, being glorified of all. Now he's in the heathen circles and all of them are glorifying him. But then he comes to Nazareth. Now Nazareth means the guarded one. That's his home. That's where he grew up. So he comes there, and he encounters another spirit. Now, I want you to stay with me just a minute on this. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, verse 16, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, he'd already been doing that in the heathen circle, and they loved it. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister. Now, listen to the words that are being used. And he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words or the words of grace which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. He said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in the days, uh, were in Israel in the days of, uh, of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill whereon uh, their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. Now, what made them so mad? Now, remember, he's been in the heathen circles. That's all this going, fame is going everywhere. Oh, they love him. He comes to the church in his hometown, the guarded place. As soon as he gets in the guarded place, it says he, he stood up for to read. That was his custom. He had a good custom. He went to church, and he got up to read the Bible. And so that's his example to us. We should go to church and read the Scripture. So he stands up, and when he reads it, he reads this in, out of Isaiah, and he hands it to the minister. The minister. This is all prophetic. He gives it to the minister there in the church. He read it. And he closed the book. Well, what was, what was the next part of that verse? And the day of vengeance of our God. He closed it before he read that part. And he handed it to the minister. He handed it to him. 
and he went and sat down. Well, now this made him wonder because there was a chair there reserved for the Messiah, and he went and sat in it. And when he sat in it, they stared at him and wondered about the words that came out of his mouth. I don't know what they thought he was doing. Maybe they thought he's doing an object lesson, but you just didn't go in those synagogues and sit in the Messiah chair. But he did. So, he's, so then he hands it to the minister, and he begins to preach, and he preaches freedom. And it makes them so mad and angry. Now listen close to this. They get angry, very angry. Now what is the prophetic of that? Well, it's this. Here, ministers, I outline for you what you preach. You preach anointing, freedom, deliverance. You preach that to my people. And don't preach vengeance to my people that I'm mad at them or hate them. Don't start that on them. Don't start preaching destruction on them. And so he said, you do that. And he said, in other words, when I, I'm the only one that can open the book again. In Revelation 5, you find it's sealed with seven seals, talking about these anointings. And the last one, only the Lamb could open them and read the rest of the verse. So we, when you preach vengeance, you're preaching about harvest coming, bad harvest. That's one thing. But when you're going to use it to beat people over the head with and just tell them how rotten they are, he said, you don't do this. Now, watch this. So they all get mad at him, and they, ri they rise up and run toward him, and they grab him, and they, they led him out of the town to the brow of a hill whereon there was a, a city was built and they might, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way and came down to Capernaum. So he just walks right through them, and he comes down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power, with exousia, with authority. He had delegated authority. He came as if he was the high jurisdiction talking. And it said when they heard him speak the scripture, that they could hear the power and the authority behind his words. That was in his words. Well, he's God in the flesh speaking, and he's anointed. Now watch this. Verse 33, and in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of, of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? Number one, it was an unclean spirit, an unclean demon. And it cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee? Unclean spirits. This means an immoral spirit. An immoral spirit was in the church. An immoral spirit was in the church. And more than one because he said, Let us alone. So there was already immorality in the church. And he said, What have we to do with thee, Jesus? Nothing. In other words, that ought to tell you right there that homosexuals standing in the pulpit, Jesus has nothing to do with that. Nothing. Adulterers standing in the pulpit, Jesus has nothing to do with that. All kinds of immorality, Jesus has nothing to do with that. He said, what do we have to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? And listen to what he said. He said, we know who you are. See, we know it. Let us alone. We know who you are. Are you come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace and come out of him. So all the uncleanness standing in pulpits, Jesus, you already see his pronouncement. He rebukes them and says, Hold your peace. Shut up. Do not talk anymore from that podium. Uh, I didn't expect it to go over. Probably never goes over. But you get immorality standing in churches where it ought not. And you say, well, God, he's just love. He just loves us all. Yes, he does love us all. Yes, he does. But you notice what he did to this person? He loved this person too. But he told that spirit to shut up. 
You've got no business preaching. You've got no business speaking out in church. He said, you have no authority whatsoever. And he said, come out of the man because he loved the man. I imagine when Jesus stood up and started preaching that day, as soon as he stood up in their synagogue, that demon that dreaded his meeting for all those years ago probably said, when they heard his voice, they just turned their back and shook and said, ah, he's here, he's here, and I have to meet him. And all the other demons around him probably just exited, went off somewhere else and left him standing there. But there was more people in there that was immoral because he said, let us alone. And all these people in these denominations, you ordain homosexuality to, as priests and, and pastors and all of this. And you have churches of all this. You want to know what Jesus has to do with it? Nothing. 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 He said nothing. It has nothing to do with it. But he loves the people. And so he would cast the spirit out and save the person. And you want to know what happened to the person that it left? Right here is what it was. When the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. The man was free. Now the man probably was already called to speak in that synagogue. And that spirit took control of that gift and was speaking himself. Yeah. And, when they, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with exousia, with authority, with power, he commands the unclean spirit. And they came out of him. They came out. And the, fa and the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. So now we see that perfection, when perfection comes, the unclean spirits, they even cry out when it walks into their presence. Hallelujah. They were all amazed and spake everyone among themselves. Now, the spirit, it of immorality loves to lodge itself in the church. It loves that. No matter what it is, the, the scripture calls it an unclean demon. It's immoral, and it lodges itself in the church. You know, whether it's, whether it's something like that or, or a bingo hole you made your church. I mean, you know, you get a bunch of people coming in gambling and, uh, bingo, and everybody just all of a sudden just taking all this money and raking this money around. Uh, don't you know God's just super pleased with that in the basement of the church? Now, when, when power over this is exercised in the church, the fame of Jesus goes out everywhere. When the power is exercised in the church, and actually the people are what's on your mind. See, when Jesus dealt with unclean spirits, you have to remember something. It was the demons that was his enemy, not the people. The people were trapped in bondage, and he came to deliver them. And so he would cast the spirit out. The person was free, and now they're free to pursue their destiny. That's just like this man in the, in the synagogue, whatever uncleanness had him bound he was speaking out in the church. He was crying out. This means that he was probably had a gift on the inside of him that God had called him to be a speaker in the synagogues, a speaker of some sort, and yet this demon had took hold of it. And it says when Jesus, in front of everybody, cast that out. Could you imagine what would happen if he did that today in a church? If he walked into a church with 20,000 people and Jesus himself walked up there because his anointing, his presence is so strong that demons start to scream and cry out when he gets near them. They scream out of people. I mean, they scream out of people. I, I've seen things. I've seen the anointing get so high in a church that demonic activity just manifests like that. 
Robin and I was preaching in a church years ago, and and um, I was just standing there ministering, and the anointing had grown stronger and stronger, and all of a sudden this piano player, the church pianist, came up and had his hands like this, and they were just gnarled, and his eyes were big, and he was scared. I mean, the fellow was scared. You could see it in his eyes, the terror on his face. He's looking at his hands because he, they drew up in front of him, and he held them out to me like that. As if, do something, please help me. I don't know what's happening to me. And the Lord said, just take your hands like this and just slam his hands together like that. So I held him out and I just jammed his hands together. When I did, he fell in the floor and he was either started rolling in the floor after that. He was rolling around with his hands or before, but he was rolling around. He got up anyway. When it was over, I called that thing out of him. He got up free. He got it free. Power of God cast that out. And later the pastors uh, asked me, pastor's wife was talking to Robin, and I said, what was that? I said, it was a devil. They said, no, that was our piano player. I said, well, it don't matter. That was a devil. So there was a devil and the piano player. Well, could it be? Well, here's a guy in the synagogue, went there every week, was there every Sabbath, but yet he never manifested himself. Maybe everybody had begun to listen to a twisted wisdom from this person, but it never cried out until it met perfection. And when Jesus walked into that synagogue, the very essence of the master, that thing screamed in torment and said, we know you, we know you. There was probably other clean, unclean spirits hiding behind pillars in the temple synagogue looking at him like that all of them afraid he cast it out of him and the man was thrown in the midst of the people well this guy was thrown down on the floor but he got up free I've seen things like that over and over it's when the anointing gets so high wonder what would happen in a 20,000 seat church today if Jesus walked in the room and half the choir started spitting green ice out at everybody or just fell over <laughs> and just fell over to the side somewhere. I've seen all kinds of things. I wonder what would happen because the presence of the master himself walk in and there could be a 300-member choir and half of them fall down and start manifesting devils. You don't know. You don't know. Unless the Holy Ghost shows you, you don't know. If he's not in your church, how can you know? And then suddenly he's, he's there. And they start doing like that. Would they ask him to leave? Well, they have before in the scripture. They ask him to leave their town when he delivered the, the Gadarene demoniac. He comes in and there's a guy who's absolutely running naked in a graveyard, chained up with ropes and chains. And all these men go out there and, and grab him and throw him down on the ground and chain him up. And then as soon as that devil manifests, he just snaps his chains, breaks his ropes. And Jesus caught, cast the thing out of him. It was a legion of demons. And as soon as he did, they come back and they find the man clothed in his right mind, sitting, talking to Jesus, wanting to follow him. Jesus said, go back in town and tell all your people that you know. Tell all your family what great things God has done for you. And the people came and asked Jesus to leave their coast. They wanted him gone. Why? They had got used to hearing the screaming devils. They were used to hearing a demonic voice. They were used to the cries in the night. I imagine the guys out tending the swine at night could hear him in the graveyard crying, and maybe it was their lullaby. Oh, the pigs go to sleep. And they were all because the guy in the graveyard is tormented up here. Jesus comes across that, that water and comes to deliver one man. And now you might have some kind of clue why the, the demon said, we, send us into the pigs. In other words, we have a right to be in them. It shows you the men that owned them were involved in something. We have a right to be in them. And so when the voice of the demonic was silenced, Jesus was ran out of town. 
they had grown to like the voice of the demonic. They liked the sound of it. They had grown used to it. Here, this man in the synagogue when Je cried out when he saw Jesus, when that devil, his worst nightmare came to pass, he met the Son of God. Then you hear them trying to, they want to throw him off a cliff. They want, and then this demoniac acts up and he casts them out. They're all mad. They're all me and mad about it. It's because it's religion. But in the circle of the heathens, they celebrated him. But when he got in church, oh my God, how can this man be annoyed? Look at this. He silenced the voice of the demon. Now you think about that. And so I'm talking about perfection. This is the kind of life the master had. This is the kind of presence he brought on the scene. Hallelujah. When this power is exercised in the church, the fame of Jesus went out everywhere. When demons were openly dealt with, when the power of darkness was openly seen to be put down and people delivered. See, we don't have the people on our minds. We, in the churches, we have to get the people on our minds. If a devil is cast out, it's not that you're mad at the person. You want the person free because God loves the person. But the spirit should have no more place there with them. And so you start casting them out in, in front of everybody, and the fame of Jesus goes everywhere. The fame of Jesus is told everywhere. Did you see what the name of Jesus did? Did you see how the, he just used the name or she just spoke the name and this thing left? Instead of on Halloween putting up pumpkins all around our church with faces cut in them, instead of having horror houses in the basement, I remember when I was a kid, well, I wasn't a goat, but I was a boy. I remember when I was a little boy, you know, and I was going through. They invited me to come, and it was the church I went to, you know, just a little boy. And they invited me. They said, we're all going down to the J.C.'s House of Horror. And I said, what? Okay, you want to go? Well, where I lived, you'd go anywhere to get away from where you lived. So we go down there, and this is what they told me. Don't worry about nothing now. Every monster, everything you see going through this horror house, they're all Christians. Everyone. <laughs> now, listen, that's what they told me because it was the Christian organization putting on the giant house of horror in Birmingham, Alabama. Said, And this, I was told those words, don't worry. Don't, be, don't let anything bother you. They're all Christians. And so one of the main missionaries of the church, I went with them. <laughs> and we're going through the, this hallway, and I'm just a little boy. But I was a country boy, so I was, all, you know, I was, I was pushing six foot tall at 12, 13 years old. So I, <laughs> I'm walking through there. <laughs> And he stepped on ahead of me, and when he stepped right past me, this big old creature stuck his head down in the middle of the aisle like that, looked at me right in the eye. I reached out like to choke the missionary to the ground. I grabbed him by the back of the collar, started yanking his collar. He was going, <laughs> and all about to die under the face of a demon. I mean, <laughs> but he was a Christian. I shouldn't have been worried. And this is... and. Churches do this, and Christians do this, and, and they surround their houses with emblems of the demonic, and they create an atmosphere for Satan to thrive in and then wonder what's wrong. Instead of casting them out, name your schools after devils. Think about that. Naming schools and, and all kinds of teams after Satan, as if he's some kind of hero. 
He's the very one that killed 60 million children of the unborn in, the, in America. He's the very one that started every world war you've ever seen. He's the very one that commits every hideous crime you've ever known in this earth. He's the one that all the blood of the dead and dying humanity drips from his fingers. And you put him on a shirt and stick him on your body. Now something's wrong with that picture. Something's wrong with that. We better get an idea of who our enemy is. Man, we don't really mean nothing by it. You know, he's just an emblem. Uh, it's just a um, uh, mascot, you know. Well, why don't you go get you some kind of dog mascot? A dog's better than that thing. I imagine how Elijah or somebody would have treated it if they'd have walked up and saw it. Now, the spirit of a demon, the spirit of the demon that has been unleashed against the church right now is Medusa. Medusa is that spirit. And your denomination is not strong enough to hold you against that spirit. Only the power in the name of Jesus and the authority and the word of God and you knowing who you are and the exousia that you know you've been given delegated authority by the power of the Holy Ghost, only that speaking the word is strong enough to resist such a thing or cast it out. Your denomination is not. Only this coming out of the mouth of a Holy Ghost filled person will do this. Everything that Jesus has deposited, deposited in you when you were born again, perfection. That's what he put in you. Oh, now, I know that don't, that's, that's probably not popular. But he put perfection in you. He had nothing else to give you but perfection. That's who he is. And so he, gave, he deposited that in your spirit when you were born again. Now listen close. And this is why you became at that time a candidate to be baptized in the Holy Ghost because on the inside of your spirit, it became perfect at that moment. Then when you were born again, you started again on the road to perfection. Now, that's, that's something you have to understand. Your flesh wasn't perfect, and the circumstances around you are not perfect, but your spirit was now born again, born of the Word of the living God. So now you started again on your road to perfection. So as you begin to walk on your road to perfection, now listen to this close, you begin to walk toward on the road to perfection, and conviction comes in your spirit. Now, I didn't say condemnation. I said conviction. When conviction comes, you shouldn't be doing this. This is not good. This is not right. It goes against what's in me. I, 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 it's just not good. This is not right. What conviction is, is, what, is this. When you're on your road of perfection, when your spirit sees that you are veering from the path of perfection, it immediately begins to warn you. You are veering off the path. And it's trying, the Holy Ghost is trying to pull you back to that road. Trying to pull you back to that road. And if you use the power and the authority of the written scripture, you must know the written word. You, it's not enough to be prophetic. You must know the written scripture. Jesus is the word made flesh. You must know the word along with this prophetic insight that God has given you and looking into tomorrow. But you must know the word so that you can operate in authority, in the exousia, the authority, the jurisdiction over anything that would pull you off the road of perfection. That's called conviction, and you correct it with the word immediately. If you do not correct it with the word, and you, you get off that road and head off into sin, you must remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all the unrighteousness of it. And he will forgive you, cleanse you that quick, and put you back on your road. But now, if you've already left the road and you've already over here in this deep sin, you may have set things in motion that it's going to take a while to correct in the natural. But he can forgive your spirit and forgive you again that quick. So when conviction comes, don't say, I'm just being condemned. You're just condemning me. No, your spirit, the Holy Spirit is telling your spirit, you're getting off the path. You're getting off the path. Veer back. Veer back. Come back on that. And he's trying to keep us on that great road. So now perfection is him and what he did and what he did in you. Conviction is when you start trying to veer off the path. We'll come and tell you this is wrong. Get back on the path of light. And then you have, um, you know, so then we start looking at correction. So you have perfection, conviction, and now correction. What is correction? He will give you his word, his word that you can stand on to get you corrected again, to correct course all over again. Conviction tells you you're, you're veering off. Correction gives you the scripture to bring you back, no matter how far off you got. Hallelujah. Well, that's what the Lord said to tell you today. I, perfection, conviction, and correction. He woke me up before daylight and said those three things to me. And uh, so I... Uh, I brought it to you today. I hope you got a lot out of that. And um, I want you to understand that the, the spirit that's been unleashed against the church is the spirit now of Medusa. Now, Medusa, people automatically think of, of sexual sin, immorality like that. But immorality is anything that goes against God. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it, could be, um, it could be over money. It could be greed. It could be uh, being corrupted in your ethics and how you start conducting yourself. It could be uh, in any form, drugs. It could be anything. Anything that's not pleasing to God is immoral. And so that's Medusa. And that's why it has many heads because everyone's not tempted with the same things. So guard yourself against that. Learn the written word. Hallelujah. And know perfection, conviction, and correction. And be willing to walk in all three. Hallelujah. And I will admit to you that uh, the moments of perfection right now just seem to be that. Moments of perfection. But I'm going to tell you something. He makes up the slack if you keep walking that road. And just acknowledging what he said about you. Start saying what he said about you. You can't say what he said about you if you don't know what the book says he said about you. He said, in him, in whom, in Christ. All of those are you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been different. I, uh, you know, we came on earlier and. There was a big explosion somewhere, and, and so a lot of things happened behind the scenes, and, and then suddenly we came back and uh, brought this to you today, and I hope you got a lot out of it. You are, you are my partners and uh, my family and friends, and I'm going to seek the Lord the best I know in every way I know, our, all hours of the day, to try to hear what he has to say so I can tell you. Hallelujah. Take courage. We are winning and we are going to win. And soon when this part of this war is over, we'll all dance around in the streets. We'll have a great time. And I want all of you to come, you know, I want you to come to, uh, come to the new church. Come down here and see us at Church International in Warrior, Alabama. Man, there's plenty of seats. It's a wonderful time. Come on down there. Just come on down Sunday. There'll, there'll be a seat. Anytime you want to come, 
If you can't come, just stretch your hands toward warrior and pray. Hallelujah. But we want to invite you to come. It's an awesome new facility, and we had a, a eight services there this past uh, week. And uh, our first Sunday service was was the pro, was the first of last week, and then we so we've had two Sunday services now, and we're looking forward to the next one. Hallelujah! Who do I hand the mic to? Come on, Krista. I want you to tell the people how to prosper. Tell the people how to prosper God's way. Amen. You know, you know what what I see is religion. Religion is all about control, but freedom is what Jesus preached. He preached it in the heathen circles first. Yeah. Then he pre and they loved him, but he went to the church and they tried to throw him off a cliff because he preached the same freedom. They didn't like that. Yeah. So there is freedom to be had in your finances. You don't have to be the prisoner of debt. Amen. There is a way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, we want to thank all of our partners for uh, not only tuning in with us, but hanging in there with us. You were there. You were there when we came back. You know, when we got back uh, in here, uh, my brother said, there's, there's 500 people still waiting. And so to those 500 that held on, Thank you so much. And to everybody that tuned in afterwards, praise God. We, we love you so much from the bottom of our hearts and just more than we could ever express to you. And so right now, I want to give you the opportunity to sow your seed. And so uh, those of you that are wanting to sow your seed today, those of you that, that feel led to, the ways to give are on the screen and also at Robin D. Bullock. Dot com. I had to think about which website I was saying. For eight services, I've said churchint.org. And so robindbullock.com, the ways to give are there, and also the links to give. You can find out all of that information. But while you're doing that, I want to, I want to share with you something that the Lord was revealing to me while I was sitting there listening to dad and I had no idea what he was going to what he was going to speak on. I had no idea what he was going to to preach about. And so I want to read you this scripture, but I want to read this scripture to you out of the message translation. We're very familiar with the scripture in 2 Corinthians where it says what fellowship hath light with darkness. And so, and then you can read the rest in, in the King James of what the original text says. But then I want to put it to you the way the message translation puts it. It says, and this is 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. It says, don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership. That's war. Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? In God's holy temple. But that is exactly what we are, each of us, a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way, I'll live in them. Spider, no. That's, that's exactly, I, I, God revealed that to me. I said, you're not getting on this mantle right here. Amen. <laughs> I just saved some of your lives right there. But that is exactly what we are. Each of us a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way, I'll live in them. Move into them. I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise. Leave it for good, says God. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. The word of the master, God. Now, see... When we give into the kingdom, when we encourage the move of God, we are partners with God. We're in partnership with him. 
This is, you know, the way that we we are partners with other people. We're we're partners with encouraging that move of God, encouraging, you know, the different because we want to partake of that anointing that is on different ministries. And the same with this one. There's a different anointing on this one than, than another ministry. And so we want to partake of, of and be a part of this. And so that is being also in partnership with God because that is God. He's moving in these ministries. And so we're in partnership with him. But so we're giving, we're giving, we're doing exactly what the word says. And I hear comments all the time. I'm tithing. I, I'm I'm doing the, the giving scripture, I'm giving my offering, I'm giving my tithe, I'm doing this. I'm a partner with God, I'd, but why am I not prospering? Well, I want you to check. Now, this is being real and transparent. I want you to check and check your bank accounts and see how many streaming networks are coming out of your bank account every month. Because, yes, we're giving 10% to God, and we're giving offerings, and we're giving our partnership. We're, you know, I'm in partnership with several ministries, and I have it recurring. It comes out of my account every month so that I don't even have to think about it. It just comes out. So I know, I know that God and that ministry has part, that anointing is touching that part of my finances. But... We're, struck, we're, we're going through this ministry, this ministry, Robin D. Bullock Ministry, Church International, the Big Red Inn, streaming service, um, the Big White D. You know, you know, you got to be, you got to talk in code because you never know what the trigger words are. They change every day. And so you're going through the big pagan goddess with the green S. That came out too. Well, as much as God has his hands on that part of your finances, they have their hands in that one. How in the world are you going to prosper to the fullest when it ain't just God that's got his hands in your money? How are you going to hold hands with the darkness when you've got the big red in? And I'm going to tell you something, Christians. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for watching this Dahmer series that's out. I've read comment after comment after comment that says, I just want to see what makes these people tick. Let me tell you what makes these people tick. They're filled with the devil. They're possessed with the devil. Jeffrey Dahmer was a homosexual, and he invited that spirit in his life, which, according to Satanists, is the strongest evil spirit you can have in your body. Why do you think it's the hardest to get rid of? And he invited that in, and I'm going to tell you what makes them tick. It's a ticking time bomb that lives on the inside of them, and it tells them what to do, where to go, who to talk to. It dictates their every single move, and then at the end, it leaves them holding the bag because they go to prison and their life is over. And guess what? They just move on to somebody else. That's what makes them tick story in, spoiler alert, it's over. You don't have to watch it. They're possessed of the devil, that's it. This Ted Bundy movie, that's ridiculous. And it's all off of one streaming platform that a lot of people that claim to be blood-bought Christians are spending their money every single month on. You can't hold hands anymore with God and the devil at the same time. You can't do that. There are other coffee places. There's other coffee. Find a local coffee shop in your area. Support them. As long as they don't support what that one does. And you know what? If not, go to the store and make your own coffee. It ain't that important. And I really enjoy coffee every day. You know, some people would say I'm not very nice without it. <laughs> but it ain't worth it, my friends. If it meant not drinking another drop of coffee for the rest of my life or supporting the murder of innocent children, yeah, that's right. then I'm water all day long. <laughs> It, it, it doesn't matter to me. This is, this is over. You wonder why you're not prospering. Quit having your right hand in the devil's hand and your left hand in God's hand. 
Stop it. And get out of Halloween. Bless God Almighty, how many times do we have to tell the Christian people, stop it. Just stop. You know, I walked in. I walked into a hardware store the other day. You know, you don't make me rip my glasses off. I'm tell you what, that's like people ripping their earrings out. You know, it just gets all over you. Yeah. And I walked into a hardware store, and and I I told my friend this. I said, now I want you to look at this from an unbiased opinion. I said, somebody who doesn't. Who, who's not, you know, anti this holiday, anti this. I said, I just want you to look at this from just a visual standpoint. So they had all the Halloween decorations on one side of the store. And I'm telling you, you walk past those things and they start growling. Half the time, that ain't robotic. I'm going to let you figure that one out. And you walk past, they start growling, and they start doing all these different things, and you hear that stupid laugh. But then on the other side, there were beautiful, twinkling red and green lights. There were snowflakes. There were all these different things. And I told her, I said, I want you to look at this and tell me which one gives you the better feeling. And I know we don't go by our feelings, but I, I'm just saying, from an un, unbiased, not even spiritually speaking, I'm, I'm just saying, which one, which one are you drawn to the most? She said, well, it's kind of a no-brainer. She said, that one freaks you out. And, and, but yet, well, I'm not into the scary stuff. I'm into the, the good, you know, I just, I love when my daughter dresses up as a princess. I want her to be involved in, in with all the other kids and everything like that. Let me tell you something. This is a plush devil, as me and my sister calls him. You want to know what a plush devil is? It's a sweet-looking little teddy bear with a knife in his hand, with a smile on his face as he stabs you and kills you. And the reason why they're plush devils is because they look so cute and so inviting. So you take them and you take them home and you sit them in your house. So you'll bring them home with you. And when they get in their house, in your house, they unzip themselves. And it's that hideous creature that you wish to God you'd never seen in your life. And it comes to invade your home. And you wonder, why ain't my finances working? Why ain't my giving working? Why ain't this? Get the devil out of your house. Just get the devil out of your house. It's really the easiest explanation. Get him out of your house. You know, Austin and I went shoe shopping one day. And the guy brought him a, a pair of, you know, the check shoe that was real, real popular. And he brought him those. He said, now, I brought you these, man. He was like, these are cool. These are the ones you need to try on. He said, I just want to see how they look. And I just sat back just wondering because, you know, you really don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And this guy was working hard. And Austin just looked at him and he said, man, he said, don't even worry about getting those out of the box. He said, I don't wear them. He said, I don't support them. And he looked, the guy looked at me and he was like, oh, really? And I looked at him. I said, I just don't give them my money. I don't give him my money. And you know what he looked at me and he said? He said, I respect that. I respect that. Standing up for the word and, and godly values and godly morals gains respect. Don't worry about people shunning you. They weren't your friends in the first place. It gains respect when you stand up for something. So you want to start prospering? Get the devil out of your house. Just get him out. Quit letting him. And I'm going to tell you what, too, Christians, that watched this hocus pocus, too, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, I saw somebody post and said, the moment we've been waiting for for years, and it came out of my mouth before I even knew what I was saying, I said, yeah, that spirit has, too. Because it was ready to step right out of that TV screen right into your home. It's been waiting the whole time. You want to start prospering. 
seeing your bank account come up, seeing your house paid off, breaking the shackles of poverty off of your life, truly being prosperous spiritually, physically, and financially, having your family prosper, sickness not coming in your house. That's, that's prosperity in all aspects, spiritually, physically, financially. And it starts with taking your hand out of the devil's hand because what fellowship hath light with darkness? Nothing. They're two opposite ends of the spectrum. And you can't do like this all the time. You can't. You're going to be ripped apart before long. And you're the one standing in the middle of this fight. And this is my close. We're in a war, my friends. My brother and sister, that's what this says. It says that he said it says that's not partnership, that's war. There's a dark side on one side, there's a light side on the other. And there's this space that's in the middle. And there's a group of people that when the biggest church split in the year of vision happened, the biggest church split of all time happened at that moment. And you, you found out who stood on the side of righteousness, who was on the Lord's side, and who was not. Who was not truly on the Lord's side. And then there's these people that don't want to let go of either one. They don't know where to go. And they're in the middle. Who's getting shot first? And I'm talking spiritually speaking. Shooting with the darts as the enemy always does. He's shooting constantly. Who's, getting, who's the easiest target? The ones doing like this right in the middle. Won't let go. Won't let go. And the people on each side just watch them just get taken down like flies. Get the devil out of your house. Get him out and start prospering. See what God will do for you once you cut all this loose. And for all my fitness friends, cut the yoga crap out. Cut it out. There is no argument with me on that. Don't even try. Cut it out. You'll start seeing your health. You'll get the fitness results you want. Get it out. We don't have fellowship with darkness. If we call ourselves a blood-bought, believing Christian, don't hold hands with the devil. It ain't worth it because he sees your demise right down the road. He'll give you whatever you want because he's going to kill you at the end of the road anyways, and he'll just take it right back. So, my friends, today, as we quote the word, just make the decision today, I'm getting the devil out of my house. I'm cutting my partnership with the darkness. And watch your life come up in all aspects. Praise God. And just don't go back. Like my dad said, just don't go back to that lifestyle. It's that easy. Just don't go back. Your best days are ahead of you. They're not behind you, and I want to see you get there. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, until next time, let's quote our scripture. Luke 6, 38. It says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it. I receive it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, Malachi 310 this is your promise it says bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, in Jesus' name, amen, so be it. Hallelujah. Well, you know, sometimes you have to just be very bold, and you have to tell people these things you know, the enemy, it's a, and here, here's something too. The enemy, the war don't take a break because it's your birthday. 
or because it's a, a special day or because uh, it's a holiday, the war never sleeps and it never breaks off. And so you have to be on your guard. And you know, it's, uh, I was, um, there's a lot of things that I, if it, if it touches darkness, it's in the dump. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, well, you know, I remember one time in, in this house we, we got and uh, they left a lot of stuff in it and these clocks and they were worth thousands of dollars, but they all had demonic faces on them and they had all this kind of stuff. So I just promptly took them outside in the backyard and took a two before and beat them all to pieces. And you could hear them in the, you could hear me in the backyard. Wham, wham, wham. Somebody asked Robin, Robin said, well, it's just your daddy out there uh, destroying idols. And so I don't want anything to do with the darkness around me. People are precious to me. Demonic spirits are hideous, and they are, they are blood-sucking ticks. They come to live off of you. But I love people, but I don't like those spirits. You know, you, people talk about the homosexual community. It's not the people that I don't like. I see a whole community of evangelists. They just stand there, and they're evangelists. That's why they're so activated. That's why they're such activists. God has a call on your life, and he's calling you into this, to evangelism, to evangelize the world. And I see a whole group of, of our family that's just out there, and the only thing holding them down is dark spirits. So I don't like those spirits. You know, you see people that's hooked on drugs and people that are just, they're bogged down with all of these drugs, some of them even prescription. It's not the people that you're so mad at. It's the spirit that's holding them in that kind of bondage. And you cannot see people free if you're going to fellowship with darkness. You have to be free. Amen. I could tell you incidences that would just absolutely, <laughs> they would be unbelievable if they wasn't real. That's happened, delivering people from spirit beings that had them bound. And some of them didn't even know they had them. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today, and I want to thank all of you for waiting with us, tuning in with us, and weathering and all this with us. And we came right back on. Picked right up where we left off, and we just moved right on into it. Hallelujah. Well, until next time. Well, before I do this, I've got to tell you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to right now do what the Apostle Paul said. He said, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that he is your Lord, you shall be saved. So why don't you do that right now? Say, Lord Jesus. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. Jesus, save me. Wash me clean of all sin, guilt, and condemnation. Take my life and do something with it. You know, not long ago I was standing in a uh, at church and I was ministering in the altars and this these two young men came up and one was so bowed over his his eyes were just his head he couldn't even raise his head and they said what well, what what's wrong and the man told me said uh, they live in a homosexual lifestyle and I looked at the man, and his head was just bowed over like that. And you could tell he was crying for freedom. And he looked at this, this badge on, my, on the, this mantle that Cat uh, gave me, and he pointed at it. He said, that, I want that gone out of my life. You know, I led him to the Lord. His eyes brightened. He raised up and looked at me and smiled. And I, I asked the other person there, I said, do you, 
do you know, and I ministered to them, do you know what's right? Yes, yes. And so I looked at him. He wanted this gone. And I told him, I said, go live another way now. Go do something else. If you could have seen his little head bowed over and that spirit pushing him down like that where he couldn't even look at me. That's the most pitiful thing you've ever seen. And if you're out there right now and you're bound up in that lifestyle and you want out, you know, the LGBTQ got mad at me big time because somebody called in and I said they were evangelists and they called in and said after, I wrote in and said after 30 years or 35 years, when I heard what you said, I was free. Well, that didn't set well with, with their agenda that they use as a weapon. But I'm telling you, everyone look, looking at me, listening to me right now that's in that lifestyle, if you want to be free, bless God, you can be free. If you want freedom and, and you want to come on into your call, you want, to, you want to have a life again, you can be free. How come if it's so honorable and it's so, such a good lifestyle, how come if somebody describes the act of how it happens and what goes on, the LGBTQ goes crazy? Because it, when they hear the sound of it, people know this is not right. It's because it's a spirit bowing them low. But if you want to be free, you pray that prayer. Jesus, I'm here. Deliver me. Deliver me. And he'll say, okay, yes. And he will never refuse you. Now that you are free. And you prayed that prayer. Write and tell us you prayed that prayer. And don't go back and live that way. Live another way. Go, go start practicing something new now. Hallelujah. And then just, if you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, say it out loud right now. Jesus baptized me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives me utterance. And then just start praying praising and thank you Jesus and then pray in tongues those sounds you hear and just begin to pray in that prayer language hallelujah well I hope you hear my heart I hope you hear where I'm coming from on all of this and so until the next time we gather together right here around God's word I want you to know beyond anything Jesus Christ loves you with everything he is. And he is not looking to condemn you. He's looking to give you life and cleanse you of guilt. Amen. And until next time we gather together right here around God's word, I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom. Mm -hmm.